how are you? This is uh, Damien from the Unshackled and we're here with a, uh, a guest. And, uh, happy hit. Happy hit. Happy hit. And uh, we actually, earlier on today, we were walking around and uh, we found him and we thought we had a chat with him and we actually went in the Lip Cafe and uh, saw him again and now we're having a little bit of a chat. So um, you were here for the, uh, the counter rally of the Recutting Australia. Yeah, um, yeah, what? it's just a counter rally against the, the rally of Recutting Cool, yeah. Alright, um, how did you go with that? I mean, well, honestly the turnout was not as much as we would have hoped. Um, I think we were curious, I think that there are reasons for that. Um, I would say that, that the main reasons are that it's much easier to motivate people with a message of anger, hate and fury. Because when, when you're furious, when the blood is up, um, it's very easy to get out, get out there and chant and, and put your fist up and, and, and protest, you know. Um, whereas when your message is one of tolerance or of love or of diversity, um, it's, it's a little bit harder to get motivated, I guess. But, but also, uh, on top of that, I would say one of the reasons for lack of turnout is the fact that um, most Australians would see a Reclaim Australia in their position as being on the fringe of Australian politics. Even people on the right, conservatives, would see this as being on the fringe. Um, and so I think the vast majority of Australians think, well, we don't need to show up to say that we don't agree with this because it's obvious. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it really does help to have the bodies there to show that this viewpoint is not, uh, is not the common viewpoint in our society, but um, you know, people do what they will. Okay, um, do, you, um, do you think that it is um, off the fringe, or do you think it's something that's um, a bit more of a, uh, I guess you could say, a, a more common reality now uh, in more modern times? I would say it's at the fringe. I would say it's definitely at the fringe. You know, there has been, um, how would I say this, uh, intolerance um, and, and hatred throughout the centuries. Um, this is not a new thing to have kids in the saying we shouldn't have immigration. People doing this back in Roman times. It's nothing new. Um, and it's always been, I think, something that's been on the fringe. I think uh, the common Australian doesn't agree with this. I think uh, it gets more attention nowadays because of people like Trump. Um, and on Trump, actually, the popular vote, of course, he's not the uh, people's president. So I think that, that also speaks to the reality of the situation. That in reality, he doesn't really represent America. Uh, he represents the views of a minority of Americans. Um, in regards to, to Trump, um, do you think that, um, I, I guess it is a, um, a, move, uh, a bit of a, a move uh, that is slowly, slowly building up that um, kind of support uh, amongst many people that, uh, for instance, are a little bit, uh, say, concerned about um, things that have happened in the past and, and they're, they're maybe um, they just want sort of a um, solution to problems that maybe politicians aren't really sort of solving. Well, if you, if you look at American politics, and, and similarly if you look at uh, Reclaim Australia and Australian politics, I think there's a commonality here amongst the people who support this kind of um, extreme right view. Um, and with, with American politics and Donald Trump, um, a lot of the people who voted for him were disenfranchised white voters from, from the Midwest who felt that they'd been ignored by the Obama administration. Their votes for him were not votes for racism, for xenophobia, or for there were votes um, that were protesting against what they viewed as the political machine and what they viewed as corrupt politics. Um, they, they might name Hillary Clinton as one of those people who they viewed as corrupt. I don't know if I would necessarily agree with that, um, but I think that that's why the votes went that way. And in terms of whether there's a groundswell and it's moving upwards, I don't think so at all. I think that people nowadays have seen this kind of thing go up, this kind of racism and, uh, and xenophobia. Um, and I think we're prepared uh, to, to rise up against it. Um, you know, there are some very famous sayings from about 70 years ago to do with, um, you know, first they came for the socialists and then they came for the trade unions. And I think people have their eyes out for that kind of that kind of movement out nowadays. Um, so it's not, not going to go that way again. Um, in regards to, uh, like you're saying, the Midwestern states, um, yeah. Uh, someone like um, Trump that was uh, the Rust Belt. <laughs> yeah, the Rust Belt that um, was running for a conservative party to be able to pull um, um, working class uh, people out and, um, and win states like that that were unwinnable and, um, for instance, several decades that were uh, blue states, uh, Democrat states. Um, 
what do you think is the is um, the driving force behind it, and do you think that um, more needs to be done, say, um, amongst the left to be able to appeal to these people? I think definitely that the left needs to focus more on appealing um, to people who feel disenfranchised, um, and at the very least to just say to them, I mean, we're in an Australian context here, so speaking in an Australian context, we are Australians, we love you as fellow Australians, and we appreciate you, and we want to work for you, we need to represent you. Um, that, that, that's what's needed, and, and, and I think that's what Trump gave to a lot of these people. Um, I think a lot of them didn't really know uh, the, the full extent of this position. Um, just trying to recall the earlier part of the question. Um, uh, just in regards to um, how he was able to uh, uh, pull states um, of the working class um, that, for instance, normally tend to vote uh, for the left. And, um, and if that's uh, a bit of a, maybe a shift uh, in the political sort of spectrum, perhaps. I think, okay, kind of. I think that there are two um, main factors at play here. The first is the one I was talking about before, the disenfranchised uh, white voters in Russell. And I think uh, a lot of them were voting in protest against Hillary and against what they viewed as a corrupt political machine. And one of the things that's unfortunate for them is they're going to find out over the next four years that Trump is uh, party to that machine and is going to be under the sway of that machine, whether they like it or not. Um, and secondly, I think one of the reasons that he was able to come to power, and remembering here, of course, that he didn't win the popular vote, one of the reasons that he was able to come to power is a lot of people on the left um, thought that it was just ridiculous, the idea that he could win the presidency, so they didn't feel the need to go out and vote. And it's the same as here today with this counter rally. People think that because a viewpoint is so radical and ridiculous, we don't need to address it and say that we don't support it because it's obvious. But it's important that we use our votes and we use our words to show that we don't support this kind of Re regarding, um, regarding, um Hillary Clinton, like you were saying before, um, there was a lot of people uh, on the left that were Bernie supporters, for instance, and they felt like uh, Hillary, uh, I guess, uh, behind the scenes was trying to um, sort of uh, uh, tear down his momentum of becoming uh, the candidate or the nominee. Um, do you think perhaps that there was uh, any sort of corruption in place, that there was some sort of, um, like many people were, were saying that she was part of a machine that's been many decades in the sort of public uh, spectrum, do you think that uh, she uh, or anyone, Podesta or anyone, uh, perhaps maybe uh, uh, was working to tear Bernie down? Um, Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, there's definitely been talk of, of the Russians having an influence um, in regards to Hillary campaign, and I've heard tell that they were involved with Bernie Sanders, not necessarily in collusion with him, but that they had access to, to some of his supporters. Um, I think uh, it's a pity a lot of Bernie uh, voters ended up going for, um, for Hillary, but uh, sorry, that's besides the point. Um, I think with Hillary, the reason why she became the candidate as opposed to Bernie Sanders um, is the same reason that people didn't think that Trump would become the Republican candidate, which is that in the past, I don't know how long, very long time, there's been a tendency in the political spectrum, both in the US and here, to move towards the centre. Mm -hmm. Like right now with the Labour Party, for instance, we're no longer seeing a party of workers, a left-wing party, we're seeing a centre of the party. Um, so there's that tendency to come towards the centre. And I think with Hillary, the reason why she was able to get, um, get the candidature um, was because she was of that, of that middle ground, or appeared to be of that middle ground. Yeah. Bernie, on the other hand, to, to many Democrats, he may have come across as um, too left-wing, too radical. And the thing, that, the thing that they didn't expect on the left, unfortunately, is that a radical candidate would come from the other side. And I think it would be interesting uh, to consider what would have happened if Bernie had actually I think there were a lot of Bernie supporters who ended up voting for Trump as a protest against. Uh, do, you, do you think? Um, do you think uh, the the WikiLeaks done damage to her? Um, like all the sort of the email uh, scandals of, uh, for instance, uh, Podesta and other people in the background that were, uh, for instance, uh, calling minorities uh, different names and, and, and um, people that they were saying that they supported uh, or represented, and it seemed to me like they were sort of using them for votes. Um, and they were doing this sort of all undercover and it came out and a lot of people might have been a bit disenfranchised with that. Um, I think that probably, uh, in fact, definitely had a great influence on the support for Hillary um, Although I have to, again, call your attention to popular vote and say that, you know, in terms of the amount of Americans that turned out to vote, um, I think 
what were we talking about? Something like 30 something percent of Americans actually turned out yeah. to vote. Very, very low number. Um, so in terms of support, um, we're talking about very small minorities of people here on both sides. Um, with with some of the things that uh, came out in WikiLeaks, uh, yeah, I definitely think that they influence people away from Hillary. But I think it's very interesting um, as we look at what happened with the, with the Russians and with the hacking. It's very interesting that we've seen this kind of release with Hillary's information, but not so much with Trump's information. And also the way that the media has kind of glossed over uh, the the interesting stuff that has come out of uh, out of Trump's situation. Um, with, uh, regarding, you were saying um, about the, the Labor Party not representing, I guess, uh, its base uh, of workers uh, many years ago. Yeah. Now, um, a lot of people have been saying um, that actually uh, the Labor Party and even the Liberals have been shifted uh, actually further left and right. Would you agree with that, by any chance? Just um, with the leadership changes and everything? Well, I guess, I mean, Malcolm Turnbull does have a reputation for being a bit more on the left than, uh, than other Liberals. Yeah. Um, in terms of in terms of leadership, I guess maybe, but I, I don't know. I, I guess I would ask you what what kind of um, ideologies would you say have come out recently that suggests that they're moving to the left? Is there, is there a change? Uh, just based on really the leadership and I guess the direction of, um, for instance, the Liberals seem to be a little bit more um, uh, pushing for environmental sort of policies now. Yeah. There's not much before, and um, there's still climate change. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, and I guess um, Labor also has, um, uh, I guess, uh, gone a little bit more left in regards to uh, social policy, like um, the uh, policies with. Um, safe schools, the LGBT sort of uh, issues and things like that, and I guess maybe that's, you know, something they wouldn't have done in the past, um, yeah, okay. but yeah, a little bit of a change, I guess. Well, I, um, I think that if this is if this is the case, and if it's a common movement, then it's a positive thing. I think um, people on both sides of the political spectrum would agree that there are meritorious arguments that come out of uh, different positions. Um, it's good when we pick up useful arguments from the left and useful arguments from the right and synthesize them to make, make a better country and a better economy and so on and so forth. Um, so if there is a movement towards the left um, and these kinds of ideologies of tolerance and love are being taken up, that's a really positive thing, definitely. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, the leadership being a sign that there's more of a movement that way, I kind of go back to Trump again here and back to Clinton again and then Bernie Sanders and just kind of say uh, that the leadership actually mostly to Clinton here. The leadership, uh, generally speaking, uh, is not seen by the people as representing uh, necessarily what the party represents. A lot of people think about and talk about a party machine that, uh, that, that puts the leader in place. And I think that someone like Turnbull, for instance, he's in power because Abbott failed. Um, he was put in power by a party machine, and that party machine that funds him, that's given him this power, that puts him in a safe electorate, that's what's going to uh, allow him to stay in power, and that's also what's going to influence him and his decision while he is in power. So yeah, it, it depends on what happens within the base of the party and the party machine, yeah. not just what happens in the leadership. Um, immigration, I guess, um, I was the big theme here um, for the Reclaim Australia rally, and um, they were pointing, I guess, to a lot of sort of uh, past attacks and, um, and incidences. Um, now, uh, a lot of people, uh, have an approach, um, say, uh, of stopping immigration um, coming into the country or, um, or uh, putting some sort of uh, boundaries or uh, hardships as to, uh, uh, I guess, push for more requirements um, for, for people to, that do come in. Um, what, what do you think is uh, the way to, I guess, solve uh, any, um, uh, for instance, uh, future terrorist attacks or, or any sort of, uh, I guess, cultural problems that uh, happen in the community. What do you think is the best way to tackle it? Well, but before I address that, that question, there's a couple of things that I have to point out very quickly. Um, which are, firstly, if we look at statistics uh, from the US, the crime rate among immigrants is much, much lower than the crime rate. Um, the crime rate, sorry, amongst the general uh, populace. Yeah. Um, so when we talk about immigrants coming in and potentially uh, doing horrible acts and committing terrorist attacks, it's really just nonsense. The likelihood of that kind of thing happening from an immigrant as opposed to someone from the country and a, a naturalized citizen or a naturalized citizen, uh, the, the likelihood of them becoming an immigrant is much, much lower. Is there, is there a bit of a cultural, maybe, um, 
I guess, do a lot of these people find it hard to fit into Australian culture, do you think? Or? I think that they might. Um, I think that it makes it a lot harder to fit in when there are people rallying and saying, your belief system is evil and we need to get rid of you and we need to, uh, we need to impose laws upon you and we need to vet you and we need to look at you very closely because you read the Quran as opposed to the Holy Bible. Um, or as opposed to the bug of our you know. Um In terms of the, uh, in terms of the terrorist attacks thing, um, the, the second point I kind of wanted to address there, um, there's, there's an implicit um, suggestion amongst a lot of people nowadays that terrorist attacks are Muslim terrorist attacks, Muslim extremist attacks. We look at the US though, we look at uh, abortion clinics being bombed. A lot of these bombings are happening because of Christians, they're being carried out by Christians. And in fact, if we look at the 20th century and we look at the, the IRA in, in England and some of the bombings that they did there, there were no Muslims involved in those bombings. Those were Catholics. Extremists can come from any part of the political spectrum and from any ideology. Um, as to immigration and how we ensure that we, we get people who aren't going to commit terrorist attacks or whatever, I would say the main points are, one, we need to vet people. Obviously, if someone has a criminal record and, and they're being convicted of violent crimes, someone's a murderer, yeah. we shouldn't be looking at them. That's, right. That's common sense. Yeah. Everyone can agree on that, whether they're on the right or on the left. I did that with my left hand and my right hand. <laughs> Opposites. Um, obviously, obviously, also, um, we, need to, we need to encourage people who come to this country and, and to any country to feel as though they're a part of the community. Because isolation from the common ideology here, which is one of tolerance and acceptance, is what helps to breed hatred, um, helps to breed aloneness, and helps to encourage them to become radicalised. So the solutions are, in my mind, one, vetting people, obviously, and, and secondly, um, trying to show love and acceptance to people who come here to embrace them as part of our community. And if we look at like the Vietnamese community that came here during the Vietnam War, I would say that they've, they've been embraced and they're a really valuable part of the community. Um, and we could do the same thing with people from any nation. We could do the same thing with people from, from France, from Syria, from the US, from Colombia. Um, but if we respond to immigrants and people from other countries, foreigners with hatred, of course they're going to start to hate us and want to hurt us. Yeah, a lot of people, um... I guess they sort of say, uh, but then what about the, the minority groups that are saying uh, in Middle Eastern countries uh, when the roles are reversed and they're persecuted and everything? And some people say, for instance, um, that a lot of people um, that do come to the country um, have it quite easy and that they um, are given you know, social security and that they're, they're, um, they're well provided for and, and that uh, somehow these people uh, aren't really appreciative of what they've been given. Um, rather than a lot of people that go overseas and they're you know, more persecuted and whatnot. Um, you see a lot of a lot of people might uh, see this as a bit of a, I guess, a contradiction and that's why they see that maybe um, they, they get the views that they do hold. Well, um, I think there's a bit of a, a fallacy in that argument, which is people are, people are looking at, say, Saudi Arabia and saying, oh, well, women can't drive there. And when women from Saudi Arabia come here, they can drive, so why don't they appreciate the fact that they can drive there? Being able to drive or being able to vote is a human right. It's not something that we're giving, it's something that they deserve, that, are, that is um, not prevented from being given to them, that, that isn't taken away from them like it is in other countries. Um, and as to people who, say, go over to, uh, to, to, to other countries where there are more strict laws um, uh, from, from our country and who are persecuted, I guess, Christians or, or atheists, women or anybody who goes to another country and is persecuted, that persecution in that country doesn't give us license to persecute people yeah. here. The solution to their persecution is to show that our country is a tolerant, accepting society where people can come to and be safe um, and live happily. Um, not, not to say, well, we're, we're, better than, we're better than them, we don't behead people. Yeah. I think that's the fallacy. Do you, um... Just in regards to the human rights that you were saying, do you think um, uh, those countries uh, should have uh, pressure um, in regards to those, uh, the way, like, for instance, uh, women are treated in different aspects and that we should be able to criticise um, 
countries that do practice these uh, uh, anti-human rights kind of laws and, and, uh, and have that sort of culture? Absolutely. I think yeah. the criticism of these countries is not only a necessity, it's, a, it's almost heroic. Yeah. Um, and it's very, very important that people in the West in the east, in the north, and in the south, uh, rise up and say, this is nonsense, you can't head people for doing this kind of stuff. Women should be allowed to drive, women well, should be allowed yeah, to vote. Yeah, yeah. Um, we shouldn't be mutilating genitals, yeah. we shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. Well, part of doing that as well is making sure that within, within our own country and within our own selves, we extricate those kind of cancerous ideas, mm. ideas of hatred and ideas of violence. Yeah, um, I mean, it's very, it's very true, like, um, they use stand up against uh, things on the left. Um, do you think that um, more has to be done on, uh, on the left of politics to, uh, to for instance, uh, criticise um, uh, things? Because a lot of people, for instance, um, that are middle ground, um, they, they say, oh, um, you're very keen to criticise, for instance, a, um, a conservative view that seems a little bit... Um, for instance, um, old-fashioned and, uh, and not with the times, but um, at the same time, there's uh, not many left people coming out and criticising these uh, countries overseas that uh, also have those same views. I think, um, I guess, as, as someone who would probably identify more as to the left than to the right, personally, I, I think that it's important that I uh, offer criticism towards those 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 nations that perform uh, human rights violations horrible things, for instance, I should say female genital mutilation, genital mutilation, full stop, is obviously a horrid, horrid thing. It's an abhorrent practice that needs to be ended. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't traffic with people who do that kind of thing. We should tell them off um, and, and do whatever we can and impose sanctions. Um, as to why people on the left uh, might be seen by people on the middle ground as not, uh, not uh, speaking about this stuff, I think there's probably two main reasons. Is political correctness maybe something that comes involved? Do you think maybe people on the left want to say something but then they feel like that they're uh, going against the minority by criticising their culture and that's why they feel a bit conflicted in how they um, approach this? I mean, potentially for some people, but I think for, for political pundits and for, um, for uh, I guess, uh, people who are uh, writing and speaking about this stuff, they should be... <laughs> Forgive me for saying this, they should be intelligent enough to know that they're not uh, racist, for instance, for criticising the policies of a particular country. They, they're not criticising the people of the country, they're criticising the policies. Um, uh, maybe it does hold some people back, and, and that's unfortunate. But, um, yeah, I think another thing that holds people back on the left uh, also is uh, a lot of the time I think people on the left feel attacked, um, from, feel under attack from people on the right. Um, and so a lot of what they do is in response to people from the right within their own country. Um, and so in, 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 a, in a sense, they're, they're too busy doing that to, uh, to respond to some of these other things. And, and finally, this is a very, very brief aside, um, the left's commitment to human rights, I think, is a, a, a slamming indictment of human rights violations. I think it's implicit if I say to you, and so should that woman over there. Um, I think an implicit statement in that is people who say that women shouldn't have the right to vote are wrong. Um, there was one thing you mentioned when we were, uh, we just uh, went down to the Lynn Cafe and just had a few words and um, you were saying that it was uh, great uh, to be able to uh, meet somebody from the other side and, and uh, basically come out and say, oh look, you know, uh, we, we have different views, but um, you know that you value the, the, the free speech. And um, yeah. how, how do you, how much do you think uh, freedom of speech is important? And um, also, do you think that um, there's anything, for instance, uh, or anyone maybe more on the extreme sort of fringe that um, are, are very much uh, against free speech and um, and want to have a lot of uh, laws in place um, that a lot of people feel that um, they, they can't really say what they feel anymore because of um, of, that it might hurt someone's emotions, like uh, in regards to political correctness and things like that. Sorry, what was the last point? Um, for instance, a lot of people that um, that feel like they can't say uh, what they truly feel because um, they may be uh, uh, chastised, uh, even uh, maybe in regards to the law or, um, or attacked from um, certain groups. Um, so how, how much do you value freedom of speech? And um, do you think it's something that... Um, 
uh, people uh, on the left should uh, rally for um, and um, because uh, there is obviously fringe groups um, that do sort of tend to um, to be uh, against free speech or, or, or that they call it hate speech and, and regardless, you know, so what would you think about that? Uh, I think freedom of speech is a prime influence in a democratic society. Um, I'm actually, uh, and I don't represent the views of the entire left here, of course, I actually think that if someone wants to, for instance, there were men's rights activists coming over here and they wanted to do these big conferences about men's rights and all this nonsense, um, and people, hotels ban speaking, and I actually disagree with that. I think that one of the best things that you can do if someone has uh, a hateful ideology, a uh, ridiculous ideology, is let them say it and laugh at them. Laugh at the ridiculousness of it. Point out how, how foolish it is. Let, let them place their arguments and then slowly but surely show how each of those arguments is wrong. Of course, there are some forms of speech that probably shouldn't be allowed. For instance, um, it's not fair that I should be able to go up to you and start calling you names or swearing at you or saying, or saying I'm going to do horrible things to you, threatening you. Right? That's why we have laws in place against that. Um, so I think where free speech violates those kind of laws, um, of course, I, I, I don't think the, the idea that freedom of speech is important so much applies there. And I think that we need to deal with those kinds of people with the law. Okay, I just want to touch base on, um, in regards to uh, the human rights. Um, do you think that um, minority rights um, have uh, more of a sort of, uh, I guess, priority than, um, for instance, um, like a majority of uh, peoples in the country, do you believe in the theory of uh, privilege, for instance, um, and that people um, haven't got all the same sort of, um, or that they're sort of born um, a certain way, and that uh, how they were born, whether they're, say, for instance, white, straight, male, that uh, they have a better than other people? Well, I think that statistically speaking, it's pretty easy to get it straight. For me, personally, for instance, as a, as a white male born in, uh, in a first world country, that I have it much, much easier than, say, uh, uh, someone born in a uh, third world country, someone born to parents in poverty. Um, I think uh, privilege is something that's very important to talk about. Um, unfortunately, it's something on which I'm not much of an expert. I probably should be, considering my um, my status as a straight white cisgender male. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think it, I think it is very important. But you know, something that kind of comes into my mind when when you saying the question you asked me the question was um the philosopher John Rawls. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he talks about this idea of maximizing the minimum. And what he says is basically in an ideal society, when we're choosing between ideal societies rather, we should choose the one in which the worst off people are the best off that they could be out of all the possible situations. Where we might have a society where the richest are very rich, and people in poverty have a terrible life. We might have another society where um, everybody has a fairly even amount of wealth, but the uh, poorest are much better, better off than they would be in this other society. Rawls says we should pick this one. We should advocate for minority people who are would that in the be, worst uh, situation. Would that be advocating for uh, a, I guess, communist-like society? You think? Well, it's interesting. If you read Rawls, Rawls believes that because of the free market, because of capitalism and a bunch of other factors, that communist society doesn't really work. Um, it's a good idea in the sense that um, the idea there is to, to maximise the minimum by making sure that everybody's at the minimum level. He personally believes that he can achieve more by having a, a capitalist society. I don't know whether I agree with that or not because I'm not a communist. <laughs> Um, so I was just going to bring you to the point of the, the protests happening in America with Antifa and a lot of the other sort of groups uh, wear masks, um, a bit violent, and they, um, I know some of them were burning a limousine and things like that. Um, do you think, firstly, that um, groups like that are taking the wrong angle of, um, of putting their views out? And secondly, do you think that, um, that um, these groups really are, are in a way, being silly because they're seen as um, not accepting the, the democratic system um, of, of the election from Trump? Um, so address the second one first. Yeah. I'm scared to go back to the popular vote. Um, I think a lot of people in America are kind of annoyed right now because uh, Trump did not win the popular vote. Um, he's not really the people's president. So in that sense, in terms of respect to the democratic system, um, people who are anti-Trump are you know, not necessarily disrespecting the democratic system. In terms of violence, um, it's very hard to, to, to give the right position on this, right? Because 
this is going to sound like a very strange example, right? But if I said to you, I have time traveling machine and I clock, why don't you go back in time and shoot and stop the Holocaust from happening? I'm sure you would say, yes, I'm going to do that. Six million people's lives will be saved. So, of course, there appear to be some situations where violence might be the answer or might prevent worse things from happening. I think this is probably not one of those situations. I think these people who are burning cars, they're doing it because they're angry. Um, I think it's, it's effective in the sense that it, it, it's a very striking image. Um, but we're, we're not at that stage. We're not at a stage where we have a state that's committing violence on the individual. When people need to defend themselves from the state, by all means, they should use whatever means necessary to defend themselves. But in a peaceful, democratic society, there's no need to go around rioting, breaking things or burning things. Uh, you actually um, showed me before that... Um thought that perhaps uh, this rally might get out of hand and you brought some equipment over to me. I did, I did actually. I brought some equipment. I was, I was worried because I've been reading a little bit about Reclaim Australia and some of the previous protests and so I brought a couple of things just in case. I got here one of my old dishcloths. <laughs> bit of vinegar. Um, just for any would-be protesters out there, dishcloth and vinegar, very good for getting through the pepper spray. Um, and of course also uh, my worst pair of sunglasses to, uh, to, protect, to protect my eyes. <laughs> Oh, and a first aid kit. Yeah, yeah. Very, Very well, well organised, for sure. Um, yeah, you know, there have been, there have been incidents in the past, in the past at, at rallies like this. You know, I just wanted to come prepared in case there was a situation. Um, personally, I don't believe in using any kind of violence against people from the other side, against police, or against the state, except for self defense. Yeah. Um, and I was hoping I would have to use them, and of course I didn't. Um, I'm really happy for that. That's good, yeah. And, and um, just, um, is there any these days um, any political parties or specific politician individuals that you would uh, say represent your values? Any people that you sort of look up to or that you... That's a hard one. I guess I would say I, uh, there are a lot of people whose viewpoints are, uh, uh, I find merit in. I found a lot of merit in, in Bernie Sanders. This might sound a little strange actually, but I found a lot of merit in Kevin Rudd back in the day. Um, but yeah, uh, unfortunately nowadays I find myself uh, becoming a bit more individualised in my viewpoints and, um, and finding it difficult to identify fully with any particular candidate or party. Um, I think that there are definitely parties out there that, that help to represent the left, um, like the Greens. Um, if there are any uh, Labour politicians watching this, I would advise them to maybe think about how they could appeal to the left as well a bit more. Um, because. You know, I used to be a labour man when I was a kid, and unfortunately, because of their policies towards refugees and towards immigration, um, I found myself feeling um, unheard and feeling as though they didn't represent me. Um, and it's unfortunate, I think a lot of people feel this way in the current political climate, that there are a lot of politicians um, that don't represent their opinions, and that when it comes to an election, they're choosing the, the, the least bad outcome. The, the, the best possible outcome out of a, out of a sea of villains, so to speak. Um, what is your plan, or what do you think is the best way to uh, tackle the establishment or the, uh, the machine, so to speak, that run um, all of the main sort of political parties? Um, how do you think we best um, tackle that and, um, and finally get sort of uh, people representing uh, people rather than, uh, for instance, uh, globalist uh, corporates and people that are sort of um, having got their interests in up. I would say a few a few main points. Firstly, if you're within a political party and you're committed to that political party, but you don't fully agree with its ideas, changes. Raise your voice. There might be people within the party who want to shout you down. There might be a political machine within the party that says, well, now we know what you think. You're never going to go anywhere. You're never getting a safe electorate from us. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Raise your voice. Cause dissent. If you don't belong to a political party, look at independents, find people who uh, express views that are similar to your own, and vote for them. Um, vote for fringe parties, and don't get restricted into this kind of bipartisan, two-party uh, yeah. mindset. Is, is there any minor parties uh, that are more on the fringe that you think have some decent values, like, say, Australia, like the minor ones? This is going to sound really, really strange, but um, uh, the last election I actually preferenced the sex party quite, quite well, a lot of people, A lot of people are saying that um, they have more sort of uh, left uh, libertarian views and um, that appeals to some people and um, it seems to be quite a common option for people that maybe uh, normally gen generally vote for the Greens or parties yeah. like that. Um, so 
the greens are very important as well. Um, greens are important because they're becoming a more legitimate political party, and as they rise to a situation of influence, um, it breaks down that kind of two-party mindset, and we stop having these these parties who are basically giving us uh, a, 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 set, a set of two options to choose from. You either you either hate immigration or you support it, or you either um, want to get rid of refugees or you want them to come in. Yeah. Um, it, it, it leaves room for politicians to then say, okay, well, I can appeal to uh, a third of people. I can appeal to a more specific mindset rather than just railing against whatever my uh, opponent says. Um, what do you think of the new uh, the Green cutoff group left renewal? Um, I know I don't know if you you, you heard much about it, but yeah. um, apparently they'd uh, burned the Australian flag recently, and um, I think they were a little bit more on the um, I guess people call them the um, Senator Rhiannon kind of um, more socialist kind of leaning and. Um, Di Natale's kind of came out and sort of um, hasn't said much about it, but um, a lot of people are sort of saying that they are more of the extremist kind of fringe. Um, but do you think um, that a group like that is trying to sort of um, get the party back on track, or do you think they're actually damaging the party? It's hard to say. I think it's important to <clears throat> express uh, sometimes more, more radical or um, different viewpoints to what your party expresses. Um, and in, in that sense, if they can come together with the rest of the party, then perhaps they'll be able to um, make a useful change within within the Greens. Um, by the same token, you know, when you go and burn a flag, it, it turns a lot of people off, you know. Um, and in that sense, they could they could be damaging the political prospects of the Greens. Um, on on flag burning, very briefly, you know, it's a very it's a very evocative symbol, and I think that's why people use it. It's hard to say whether Would it's... Would it be seen as hate speech, do you think? I think it depends on what the, the idea behind it is. I think some people might burn a flag saying, uh, uh, I hate this nation, destroy this nation, right? So it's, uh, say, um, uh, fundamentalist, uh, radical uh, Muslims in the Middle East might burn a US flag to say, don't come here and form our soil, stop invading us. Um, and that's more of a destructive message. Whereas I think a lot of the time when people do it here, they're more uh, railing against the idea of um, that Australia, the, the white Australia, the Australia that doesn't acknowledge what's happened to Aboriginal people in this country, um, the Australia that wants to uh, put refugees in offshore camps, in concentration camps. And um, It wouldn't be the fault of the actual uh, the flag itself. I mean, um, <laughs> if, these, if these people I mean, are a fringe, like you said, then um, would it would be seen as... Um, a bit of a uh, extremist idea to to say, uh, I guess, due to the actions of some, sort of categorise it as a, a whole sort of like by burning a flag, for instance, and, and do something like that, even though it is a fringe group that might not sort of uh, have the same views. Um, I think. So what what you mean to say is that when when they that when they're burning the flag, they're doing it against a, a particular fringe, um, but it. it Cross as being against the nation. Yeah, as a that's whole. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's probably the main reason why flag burning is not a good idea. Yeah, because it threatens, um, at least in, in the minds of many Australians, it threatens them, it scares them, and it, it comes across as a little bit barbaric or a little bit brutal. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard for me to say. You know, people at protests they will use very, very vitriolic banners. There was a banner at uh, Reclaim Australia talking about um, the R word, fugees. Um, Comparing refugees to, to, to rapists, and um, that's obviously a very, very hateful thing to say, and it's putting a, a lot of people into a box. Um, it's, it's classing a whole uh, group of people according to the actions of a fringe which probably doesn't even exist. Yeah.